Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm your host for today, Mason, and I will be covering one of my personal passions, video game history. Something that I've been meaning to talk about and figured this was a perfect time to do so, especially with the research I've been gathering. If this subject interests you, make sure to let me know in the comments, and I'll continue this series. Thank you, and enjoy. Early History Video games started, in a way, much earlier than I expected, with the first coming out in 1940. It was a large electromechanical machine that played NIM, fittingly dubbed the Nimitron. A mechanical strategy game where two players would take from piles, either trying to avoid the last object or gain it, which uh, differed depending on which version they played, some being more formal than others. Uh, which, to be honest, I don't completely consider a video game. It wouldn't be until 12 years later, a professor from Cambridge created a video game, suitably named OXO. As the name suggests, it played tic-tac-toe, created being created as a thesis on human-computer interaction at the University of Cambridge, which I consider as the first real video game personally. With both of these being rather impressive, the first game to use a screen was still yet to come. Arriving in 1958, William Higginbotham created Tennis for Two, using an oscilloscope screen, an electronic test instrument that graphically displays voltages, with the game being a side view of a tennis court and both players using a knob on the controller to change the angle of their shot and pressing a button at the correct time in order to hit the ball onto their opponent's side. The game was a big hit during this three-day expedition at the Brookhaven National Laboratory, taking a large leap from previous video games, with only four years later in 1962, as you can see, you know, the um, speed of the games being created is just exponential. A student at MIT invented Space War, a game that involved space combat using the PDP-1, Program Data Pro Processor 1, which had a cutting-edge computer, primarily found in universities, with it being the first video game to be able to be played on multiple computer installations, meaning it could be played on any PDP-1, and was not, and was, not needing specially, and was, not needing any specialized hardware, making it groundbreaking. It wasn't until 1967, though, that the early version of the Odyssey was prototyped, dubbed the Brown Dogs. After being licensed in 1972, it was renamed Odyssey and sold as the first video game home console, selling for $99.99 per unit, being the equivalent of about $699 as of 2022, roughly selling a whopping 350,000 units for the time, which was huge, featuring games like Simon Says, Football, and Tennis. Starting games as we know it today. Arcade Gaming A year before the release of the Odyssey, however, the first arcade game was created by the founders of Atari, a still widely known video game company making name uh, to this day. It was called Computer Space and featured space combat, similar to Space War. Following its success, Pong was released in the next year, becoming widely popular. At this point, we're moving close to what is widely considered the golden age of gaming, myself included. So I'll not be able to cover most of the games released during the time as thoroughly as before, as much as I would like to. Arcade games steadily grew until it skyrocketed in 1978, with the release of Space Invaders and Pac-Man in 1980, starting the golden age, which would last until 1983. During this time, extremely popular titles such as Frogger, Donkey Kong, Centipede, and Defender were released, still being classics and loved to this day. For example, I still have an old arcade machine in my own house that plays those exact games and many more, adding yet another reason for the time period to be called the Golden Age of Gaming. Alongside much more malls being built around that time, arcades were as well, meaning the arcade consoles were selling like wildfire, not to mention the social scene that the arcades made for kids and parents at the same time. Sadly, however, with its rise, they had to, there had to come a fall, and so it did. In 1982, during what was considered the peak of the Golden Age of video games, it also started the decline, with parents and activists saying that they had harmful effects on children, as well as taking arcades away altogether in some places, coupled with the rise of home gaming, there was less and less of a reason to go spend money at an arcade. 
resulting in the video game crash in 1983. They would return later down the line, however, in 1985. The market would recover, moving into 1986, where it would thrive again, continuing to grow through the 80s. With an advancement in technology that I frankly won't bore you with, the industry grew. This was when the rise of martial arts ga- action games came about, featuring uh, titles that would inspire games like Tekken and Street Fighter, as well as motion simulator games like the motorcycle games still f- commonly found in arcades today. Alongside sports games such as the famous Punch Out, featuring the infamous Mike Tyson final boss. The Rise of Home Gaming Jumping back a few years, home gaming truly started in 1975, when Atari released a home version of Pong, becoming as successful as its arcade counterpart, followed by two years later in 1977 with the Atari 2600, kicking off a second generation of video game home co- video game consoles, with its interchangeable cartridges, multicolored games, and joysticks revolutionizing home gaming, allowing for them to flourish alongside the arcades with this game Things such as the first third-party game company, a company that makes games but not consoles, which was Activision, still making games to this day. It also came with an oversaturated market, with too many games being released, the quality tended to plummet, with the notorious E.T. becoming one of them, widely considered as the worst game of all time. Alongside competition from computer gaming, it all led to a crash in video games as a whole in 1983. Only two years later, in 1985, however, it'd be revived by Nintendo. The release of Nintendo's NES, Nintendo Entertainment System, in the United States recovered the home's gaming scene, featuring improved 8-bit graphics, color, gameplay, and sound much better than any competing consoles at the time. It left such a big impact that I still play knockoff emulators of it. Emulators being uh, something that uh, emulates the game and isn't actually official Nintendo. Especially early Mario, which is super fun to play couch co-op, or two players with one screen. Nintendo would go on to bring important franchises that are still around today, such as Mario, Legend of Zelda, Metro, Tetris, the list goes on and on. They also imposed much more regulations on third-party game development for its system, stopping rushed and low-quality games such as AT, with big third-party developers making games for the NES, such as Square Enix, which at the time were separate, being named Square and Enix separately, making the still popular games of Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest, respectively, eventually leading to a console wars with a rise in the home gaming market. Sadly, this is all I have time for in this episode. I really hope to continue it as a series, and I've enjoyed this. It's likely that I will anyway, but it would always be recommended to comment on the video just to let me know that you like this as well. Anyways, I hope to see you next time. Thanks for listening, and bye!